We're going to be looking at the first chapter of Leviticus tonight. So if you'll turn there. And stand and follow along as I read this first chapter. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own, his own voluntarily will it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priests. Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely, of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priests. Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. And he shall cut it into his pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar." But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. And the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight our petitions our pleas might be a sweet savor unto thee as we lift up not only our prayers, Father, but those of people perhaps uh, who obviously can't be here tonight for one reason after or another. We just ask that they'll be accepted and that in your grace you'll find uh, a way to answer these petitions quickly and completely. We do thank you for the good news that we heard about Paulette and pray that she'll continually be, be, continue to be healed and soon back among the people that she loves to be with so much. And Father, if there be others that we are not aware of that have hurts tonight or need encouragement, we ask that you'd lift them up. Be with our preacher and, and Carol as they continue their uh, fellowship with family, and when the appointed time comes, return them safely to our company that we might rejoice together in the wonderful work that the Lord is doing here in the congregation. And we'll thank you for all that is done and give you all the glory in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So, there are five offerings. They're easy to remember. Remember I said last week you've got five fingers. You can remember them that way if you apply a name to each one. There's a burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering, trespass offering, and sin offering. You can do it alphabetically as well. And... Uh, when you get to the meal offering, sometimes that's called a cereal offering, sometimes a grain offering, so you have a little trouble there, but you can do it. All of them, and we're going to look at them individually over the course of time, but all of them uh, represent some aspect of the work of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And if you want to read ahead and study these uh, through, I think that you'll find uh, 
the book of Leviticus to be very instructive because the more you learn on your own, uh, the more it's going to mean to you. Tonight we'll look at the first offering, the basic one, uh, but before we get to it, try to be patient with me just a little bit longer. I need to do a little donkey work, so to speak, some of the hard work. Uh, that is what we perceive to be hard and, and boring sometimes. In the course of the studies that we're going to be going through, I want to show you that in each of these offerings, uh, there was a pattern that was followed, which was fulfilled when our Lord Jesus Christ became man and died on the cross, and died on the cross. And so meeting the requirements of God, we'll see that, but we'll also want to get uh, behind that and look at some other things. Because when Jesus died, so he was also taking our place. One of the great truths of the gospel is that when Jesus died on that cross so many years ago, um, he became exactly what we are just before he died. And that, in fact, uh, is why God put him to death, as we see in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin for us. So each of these offerings is a revel revelation of what we are as fallen human beings, as bearers of the Adamic life. Uh, so if you want to understand yourself, then pay attention to these sacrificial offerings. You'll find out a great deal. They represent what Jesus Christ had become, uh, had to become in order to help us might surprise you to know, to, to realize that uh, the burnt offering did not originate in Leviticus, but is found early in the book of Genesis. Um, concord, consulting a concordance, how many of you own a concordance? Good. Everybody, all Christian families ought to have a concordance. If you look into that, you'll find that the first occurrence of the burnt offering was in Genesis, in chapter 8. It was the first burnt offering, <clears throat> and it was that that, uh, that Noah offered uh, after the floodwaters had receded, at which time he offered a burnt offering of all the clean animals. And the first offering that we encounter in Leviticus is the burnt offering. And it followed a five-step pattern, uh, as all of the rest of the offerings do, First, a selection was made uh, of what animal was going to be sacrificed. If an animal was going to be sacrificed, it had to be uh, determined whether it required a male or a female that had to be chosen. In the case of the burnt offering, as we'll see as we go through this, it always had to be a male. It had to be without blemish, blemish, no defilement of any kind, and uh, that's, uh, this burnt offering was really something in the lives of the Israelites because uh, animals were the most precious possession that they had, uh, and it was a very costly thing for them to bring a sacrifice. But then after they'd selected the animal, they laid, in the second step, they laid their hands on it. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's God's way of teaching the great lesson of substitution. The fact that we humans are all tied together but with each other, <clears throat> that we belong to one another, and we share life together, and that there is a way that we can substitute uh, for one another. Now, in the case of dealing with our deepest guilt, that substitute has to be, had to be, a spotless, sinless person. And of course, we know that the only person that ever fulfilled that requirement was Jesus Christ. And that's why he's the only one that can redeem us. But <clears throat> there are other ways in which we're linked together. And this is in the right of identification. The laying on of hands. 
Remember, I just mentioned that the party that was sacrificing had to lay his hands on the animal. Um, the laying on of hands is God's expressive way of teaching us that we belong to each other. That's why when someone is sent out on mission work, the senders often lay their hands on them. And in so doing, they were saying, we're with you. We're with you, brother, or we're with you, sister. Whatever comes, we're together with you in this mission work. The third step was to kill the animal involved immediately. God never allowed any compromise on that point. God never said to the offerer, this is a nice, cute little lamb, innocent of any wrongdoing himself, so if you just drain half a pint of blood, that'll be sufficient. I'll be satisfied. God wasn't about to say that. He would never say such a thing because he wants to impress upon us the fact that the problem he is dealing with in human nature is so intense and so deeply rooted in our lives that nothing but death can solve it. The seriousness of the problem can't be relieved by some temporary expedient. And then the fourth step was the sprinkling of the blood, as we read earlier in Leviticus here, or uh, the burning of the portions of the sacrifice as an act of consecration, an act of commitment to God. You see, the instant that one of these animals died, it became acceptable to God. Death solved the problem of separation. Death solved the problem of alienation. And then the sacrifice could be offered to God. And then the final step was a ceremonial indication of a restored fellowship, a relationship. Usually, uh, they sat down and ate part of the meat of sacrifice. The offerer did that. And this is where the, pe the Hebrew people got their uh, meat dishes because they could eat only the meat of their sacrifices. Now, later on in our studies, we'll get into a portion where uh, we'll, we'll discuss some of those things that they could eat and couldn't eat and the reasons why and how it affects us today even. But every animal that they killed had to be slain at the door of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting as it's called often in scripture. And there were some offerings like the burnt offering from which they couldn't eat. But with these, God gave them other means of indicating that their relationship had been restored and that there was peace again. So let's spend a few minutes uh, focusing on the burnt offering because this was the most, it was the basic offering of the most often uh, offered sacrifice in Israel. And every morning and every evening, the priest in the temple, or in our case, the tabernacle in Jerusalem, would give a burnt offering. It was called the continual offering and had to meet certain requirements. The first distinction, as I mentioned already, is a very important one, and it was that it had to be a male without blemish. They had three choices as to the kind of animal, if you look at verses 3 to 5 here, and we'll review them again. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priests. Aaron his sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. If you were fortunate enough, uh, rich enough, you'd bring a bullock, a bull. But if all you had was a herd of goats or a flock of sheep, then another provision was made. Look at verses 10 and 11. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord, and the priest, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. 
this very act was significant in terms of the coming uh, work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see more of that as we go along here. And then finally, if family was uh, the sacrifice, the offerer was very poor and had no animals at all, they could bring a bird. Uh, verses 14 to 17. And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. And the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of ashes, of the ashes. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. All this sounds pretty bloody, pretty gory, don't you think? But God is saying something very important through all of this. He's being very specific uh, in his directions to the Israelites. He's indicating by these three sources of sacrificial animals that this is a provision made for everyone. Uh, there's no one that's left out of the provision God has made for eternal life. Even the poorest, in this case in Leviticus, can offer something as a burnt offering. Everybody no matter what their status in life, no matter what their position, has something that they can offer to God. Remember in the New Testament when Mary, uh, Joseph and Mary took that little baby, uh, Jesus, up to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day? They gave a burnt offering. They were so poor that all they had was, uh, were two turtle doves. There were certain other things that were important about this burnt offering. The reason why it always had to be, to be a male uh, was because in Scripture, a male always stands for uh, leadership, initiative, and dominion. Now, females in Scripture always signify support, always signify following that uh, dominant male in his leadership and then uh, giving a response to that. But there were offerings two for which a female was specified. These were not matters that were simply left to the discretion of the offerer. They were specifically told what to do because this would teach them the truth they needed to learn. So for the burnt offering, they had to bring a male without blemish or disfigurement. That was a recognition of the fact that in the most basic of offerings, God was dealing with man as a king and as a sovereign. You're aware of the fact that man was made to rule, are you not? Man was made to rule. He was never meant to be in bondage to anyone. Never made to be a slave. That's exactly why we get so restless when we're placed in enslavement uh, confining situations, or in bondage of any kind. We just simply can't stand it. God has placed something deep within us to make us want to rule. Remember how David puts it in Psalm, 80, Psalm 8? He looks up at the stars and he said, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Psalm 8, 4, and he answers his own question. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All the fish, all the dwellers of the sea, all the animals and the birds, everything is put under the authority of man. That's man as God created him. And he still feels it. That's why we're not content unless we're running things, despite the fact our wives try to stop us sometimes. No scientist is satisfied to be excluded from an area of knowledge. No explorer is content to leave a mountain unconquered. You remember the famous remark made by uh, Edmund Hillary, Sir Edmund Hillary, who having climbed uh, Mount Everest, 
Asked why he did it. Remember what he said? Because it's there. Man has an insatiable desire to conquer things. And all of this is a dim, sometimes unconscious remembrance of the dominion God gave to man. And that is symbolized by the selection of the male for the burnt offering. The most basic expression of our lives is that we're made to rule. Every one of us, men, we're not made for being dominated, but to dominate. The second distinctive of the burnt offering, <clears throat> also very important, was that it was to be totally consumed by fire. Totally consumed. Nobody ever ate the meat of the burnt offering. Look at verses 6 through 9 here. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water and the priest shall burn all on the altar. To be a burnt offering, or to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. <clears throat> there were three sacrifices, three sacrifices that were said to be pleasing odors to God, real delights to Him. And the first one of these is the burnt offering. We'll get to the others uh, in another study. But God says that there's something about man which, uh, when He recognizes, that recognizes his right to rule and gives himself entirely to it uh, is pleasing to God. So God is thereby teaching us that man was meant to be his. We are meant to be totally God's, belong totally to him, holy, the whole man, body, soul, and spirit. We're all to be dwelling place of God. That's why when we trust Christ as our Savior, we learn that the Holy Spirit comes in to dwell within us. And it's only when that occurs that man is able to rule and rule adequately. And this is the recognition of the most basic hunger of man. It's a reflection of our need to belong, to be loved, to be accepted. I think I hit that point early on in one of my previous uh, sessions. We need to have an identity, a, relation, a, a relationship, a cause to live for, sometimes a cause to die for. Man is forever restless if he doesn't have this sense of belonging. And we're never going to find our ful fulfillment in our own humanity in expressing ourselves until we find uh, it in committing ourselves totally to God. You and I are searching for someone to love us. That's the most primitive and basic hunger of our lives. Because, you see, man isn't God. We like to think we are sometimes. We try to act like God. We try to run the universe and have everything revolve around us. The poem Invictus, written by a man named William Hemley, William Ernest Hemley, expresses this thought that we think more highly of ourselves sometimes than we ought. Let me share it with you. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You know that's a satanic lie, don't you? Who is the master of our fate? God is the master. You know, God could 
click off a little switch inside each one of us right now, and we'd be gone. We'd have nothing to say about it, not a single thing. No man runs his own life or controls what happens to himself. And so because man isn't God, the man is not made to exist by himself. He was made to be possessed, to be owned by another, to belong to someone else. Now isn't that strange? Here we have two great truths linked together in Scripture, but seem to be contradictory. Man was born to rule, but he was born to be possessed. He was made to be king over all, but he was made to be under the authority and to be possessed by God. And man is very unhappy, although they don't always know it, but they are unhappy unless he is possessed by God. And so those two things appear to contradict, but they really don't. May I suggest that you see this, you can see this truth illustrated in yourself or in your family <clears throat> and every, everything around you, in your social atmosphere at least. This is why a child desperately needs a family, desperately wants a family. A baby who doesn't have a name or identity is a restless, unhappy person. He needs to belong to a family. I read the story of a young man. He was in his late 20s and in trouble with the law. He was a confidence, confidence man, a slick artist, master at conning people into doing things that would work to his financial advantage. But he was in trouble because he'd been caught. And he was attending a church where the pastor learned about his story and tried to help him. It was an amazing story. This uh, young man hadn't known anything about his own identity until he was 14. And then he learned that he was the illegitimate son of a girl who had gone to a foreign field with her missionary parents. She had fallen in love with a young man and uh, without the benefit of marriage they had a baby. And because of the involvement of the family, because of pride, basically, which always results in cruel treatment, that little baby was sent back to the United States and put in a foster home. Nothing was told the foster parents as to the child's uh, origins, nothing about where he came from, who he was, and he was finally passed along to an orphanage where he grew up, not knowing anything about himself nor his family. Nothing about his background and history at all. And he was given a name that identified him in a way, but he knew it wasn't his real name. And when he was old enough to work, he was given access to certain funds in connection with his employment. And one day he embezzled $5,000. And he did it for one reason only. First thing he did was to hire an agency that could trace his background, hopefully, and determine uh, who he was, where he came from. And he spent the whole thousand, the whole five thousand dollars on that purpose, and he did find out. But he had been so disturbed that he couldn't rest when he couldn't find his identity, and he was willing to risk punishment in prison, and he got it until he found out who he was and where he belonged. And that's what the burnt offering is telling us. The most basic quest in our lives is to find out where we belong, who we belong to, to be identified with them, to be loved by somebody, to be accepted and possessed and owned by someone. And that someone is God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Nothing is more pitiable and pathetic than somebody who feels that there's no one to love him, that he doesn't belong to anyone, that no one cares for his soul. A third characteristic of the burnt offering, and this is most important, 
is that it had to involve a death. Death in these, all, in these offerings that we'll study is always a picture of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. So when these Israelites offered this sacrifice, they were learning the great truth that only by means of death of an acceptable substitute can man ever satisfy the great longing to belong and to be possessed by God. This is telling us that only in the recognition of the death of Christ for you and for me can we ever satisfy that longing. He's the expression of the love of God. John 3.16 So we must give ourselves to God through Christ. Acknowledging that God owns us find that truth in Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And that life I now live by faith of Son of God who loved me. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. God does not now and will not exploit us and run us like robots or slaves. He loves us and wants us to. He wants us to fulfill. He wants to fulfill us. And set us free, but we do belong to Him, and that's the most basic truth of all. And this is what the burnt offering is, offering is saying. Only through the death of Christ, and only through the relationship with the living God, which that death enables, can this hunger for belonging be stilled and this desire to be long be met that's what accounts for the joy and the relief we feel upon becoming a Christian remember that feeling I remember when I went forward that night on the 6th of May in 1900 none of your business I uh, never felt such joy and I was quick to tell people about it. Now I belong to God. He's my Father. And that brings us to the fourth and final distinction of the burnt offering, which is given in chapter 6, where there are some additional instructions to the priests about how to make these offerings. If you want to turn to chapter 6 quickly, in verses 12 and 13, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. So what is God saying by that? Simply again, that this is the most basic relationship of our lives. That no other need can be met until this need is met. Every morning and every evening they were to offer that burnt offering. Remember those cards we get at Christmas time that speak of or depict all of the sheep outside <clears throat> the shepherds with their flocks? We like to think about that as a nice uh, sylvan scene peaceful and all of that kind of thing. But really it was uh, it doesn't, it doesn't speak at all about the real violence that was coming to those animals. They were out there so they could be sacrificed uh, on the altar, the burnt offering, uh, every morning and every evening, year after year after year, decade after decade, century after century. Those priests were busy with those offerings. It would consume the wood and the flesh all through the day and all through the night so that the fire never went out. And this was the central and most basic of the offerings. By it, God is saying that you can never find any other hunger in your life satisfied until you have found this one answered, until you find out that you belong to God, that you are His, holy, completely, body, soul, and spirit. If you want to solve any other problem of life, you have to begin there saying, I belong to the Father, I'm one of his family, I'm a child of God, and I know him as my heavenly Father. I've been accepted by him, and I know he loves me. 
if this is true of you, and I trust it is tonight, then you have the basis upon which all of the other relationships with your fellow man and with God can be built and worked out. Father, we do indeed thank you for this basic of all uh, instructions. As we go from this place tonight, Father, perhaps we can go out with a better understanding of the needs of humanity to be loved and to be accepted. And there's those around us, each and every one of us, that are miserable in today's society and they don't know why. And it's up to us to share with them what can be done about it. So give us the boldness to be the witness for God that we ought to be. Father, now we will be laying before the throne of grace those petitions and prayers that we'd like you to answer. And again, we ask that you'll answer quickly according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.